Welcome everyone. Thank you for joining us for today's webinar. My name is Will Hickson. I am part of the WCA staff. We are very excited about today's webinar, uh, 2017 Employment Law Update. We're going to be talking about top labor and employment trends that you want to keep an eye on. I also wanted to mention that the Car Wash Show is coming to Las Vegas in April the 4th through 6th of April at the Las Vegas Convention Center. So be sure to register for that at carwashshow.org. Uh, a couple things about the webinar. You will be on mute to avoid any background noise. If you have any questions, you'll see the questions box on towards the bottom of your control panel. You can type in your questions there, and our presenter will periodically take a look at those and answer questions. Our speaker today is Gary Bethel. He has worked for Littler Mendelssohn for 30 years, and he advises and represents clients in various areas of employment and labor law, including discrimination matters, wrongful termination cases, and all aspects of labor management Relations. So I will now turn it over to our presenter, Gary Bethel. Thanks, Will. Good afternoon, everyone. I wanted to, uh, first of all, thank all of you that are attending. And um, as Will said, just a little bit of background. Um, I represent probably north of 200 car washes um, all across the United States from East Coast to West Coast. Um, I am located in California, but as you can see on the slide that you have in front of you now, when I started with this firm um, 34 years ago, there were 70 lawyers, and now we have uh, 70 offices. If you would like a copy of the PowerPoint that I am using as a part of this, because I know uh, you may want to look at that or take notes or look at it further later, please email me. My email address is listed there on slide two. You'll see at the bottom, gbethel at littler.com. Um, what I wanted to talk with you about just today in general is the overtime issues um, based on the DOL changes, um, state-specific type of issues that may come up, and the exempt status of when somebody at your car wash is truly, in fact, non-exempt, meaning uh, they are not exempt from overtime as versus exempt. We don't have to pay them overtime. We're also going to look at the issues associated with when can you terminate an employee who either has a industrial workers' comp health-related issue or a non-industrial uh, you know, medical issue that doesn't allow him or her to do the essential functions of the job. We'll look briefly at joint employer issues because of the importance of realizing if you're using temporary agency variety employees, the risk that that may, that may pose you. Um, quick look at arbitration issues. And I put a list together of the most common wage and hour issues that operators face. I can tell you that is by far the most common thing that I deal with operators on as it relates to car washes and car wash issues. So thanks, and if you, if you do have questions, um, please let me know or send them in, and I'll try and answer them as we go. We're looking at 30 minutes, 35, 40 minutes, depending on how this goes and the, the, if there's questions. So let's go to uh, the next slide. Uh, I know all of you are aware that we have a new president. Surprise. Um, embraced chaos and what's going on right now with President Trump. And I gave you a little history of the Department of Labor's overtime regulations. And I highlighted the most important part, and that is that as of November 22nd, 2016, the Department of Labor's regulations were enjoined, as in stopped, as in their tracks, by a federal court. That is still the case. It isn't clear exactly what the Trump administration is going to do. Um, but I think most of us on this phone would be shocked if the Department of Labor continues to pursue this under the Trump administration, and it's likely to die a procedural death because the Department of Labor simply won't 
appealing. But at this point, it's on hold. Now, I, I want you to notice the last bullet point on the slide. You, those of you in California, um, are still going to have salary threshold issues related to someone's exempt status. And we'll talk more about that. But no matter where you are, there's, it's not only state law, it's not only federal law now, there's a third layer of obligations. And that is the states, the cities, um, the local ordinances that employers, operators have to follow. You have to be aware of them. If you're not aware of them, it can cost you a huge amount of money. Let's go to slide four. Now, what was going to happen under the proposed DOL overtime changes? You can see here that the current salary threshold for exempt employees under federal law is $23,660, which if you're paying somebody that amount and there isn't an applicable state minimum remuneration payment requirement, then you have met the federal criteria for the salary component of exempt status. Now we're going to talk about that's not the only component necessary to be exempt. So if I'm talking to you or anybody else and they tell me, listen, I have a salary and I pay them a salary, I don't have to worry about it, that makes the hair stand up on the back of my neck because I am not absolutely sure that you understand that there are more, pipe, more parts to it. Now, as you can see, the next bullet point on the slide, and you probably heard, uh, without the federal court in joining this back in November of 2016, that would have raised from 23,660 to $47,476 a year, which means that in court, according uh, in in order for an employee working at your operation to be considered exempt from overtime as a manager, general manager, whatever the status was, they would have to be making $47,476. Status, still unresolved, so we'll all have to stay tuned to see what happens with that. Let's go to still staying within the overtime criteria here. Just a couple of things. Even if the employee made the 47,476, if that gets upheld, or whatever your state law may require, and I made a note, and there'll be another slide on this coming up, California currently for 2017, based on a minimum wage of 1050 per hour, um, which could be higher in some of the locations where you may have your operations, um, is 43,680. And what I've highlighted there, and I want you to take away from this slide, in, and we'll reinforce that in subsequent slides, is you have to meet a duties component. And it's more onerous in some states than others. Um, yeah, under the general federal rules, it's a qualitative kind of a test. Under the state rules, California, for example, it's a quantitative, meaning you have to show 51% of their work was exempt duties in any one day. A couple presumptions you'll run into in certain states um, and in front of certain courts is that when the employee brings an action against you, and, and let me remind you all, if an employee brings an action against you, they are no longer your friend, right? So if they're no longer your friend, um, then you can't expect that you're going to get any help from them as it relates to these issues. So you have to prove last bullet point on there, they're presumed to be an hourly employee entitled to overtime. That's what non-exempt means. The employer then has the burden of proof of establishing that they're exempt. So you, the employer, have the burden. Let's go to slide number six. Okay, now, again, don't let this confuse you, please. This is, in California, the minimum wage for employers, if you look at the title of this slide, has increased if you have 26 or more employees. If you have 25 or fewer employees, the increases that are set forth in this table are delayed by one year, meaning the increase if you have 25 or fewer employees 
would be would begin January 1, 2018, and then would track what you see on this screen. But I want you to pull your eyes to the far right hand side, and it says what the salary threshold is for overtime exemptions. And you're going to at the bottom of the page. I, I want you to do this if you want to, so you hammer it into your into your understanding. The MW stands for minimum wage, so it's fairly simple. It would be minimum wage times 2 times 40 times 52. And if you take any of the numbers in the new rate and apply that formula, you will end up with the number that's on the far right-hand side. So let me draw your attention just for the California. And again, I promise this is all we're going to talk about as it relates to California. But go to the on the left-hand side, the increase date, and see January 1, 2019. Notice January 1, 2019, California's minimum payment requirement is $49,920. So for, as we just talked about, the federal, even if it went through, is only uh, $47,476. So you in California, and if your state has a similar requirement, are going to have to track the state because at that point, you're not going to be able to continue to pay $47,476. So you kind of get whipsawed here. Whichever is the higher of the two in your state, whether it's the federal requirement or the state requirement to be exempt, um, you need to pay it. And you can see if you follow on down what that will be. Now, the big three. So I, I want you to think about the person that works for you that you get a little bit of acid reflux about when you start talking about whether they're properly classified as an exempt employee. And we've been referencing, we know what the salary compensation requirements are. We talked about it, what it currently is under fed, federal law. Um, and we talked about if you were in California, what it would be. So assuming we're paying that amount of money and we can meet that, that component, it's fairly straightforward. Now, are they being paid second requirement on a salary basis? So Listen, in meeting the salary requirement, you can't rely on commission or bonus or any other contingent payment that they may receive at the end of the year. They have to receive a set amount that equals the, if it was 23660 or um, the 47476 or any of the California numbers, they have to receive that each work week or each pay period, and at the end of the year, it all has to have been paid, and, and it's regardless of the number of hours they work, et cetera. So there's some contingency or some commission has to be added or bonus to add it to it, then you're not paying them on a salary basis. And finally, as I talked about earlier, the most difficult part of it um, is that you have to show that the employee spent 51% of their time, at least in California, doing exempt duties. Let me give you an example. If you were talking about a supervisor at a car wash, hiring, firing, scheduling, directing, training, evaluating, disciplining, etc. Okay, 51% of an average workday, do they do that? If they spend 51% of their time doing the same as the people working in detail or working in the loop center or working in um, in the tunnel, then the argument is that they're not an exempt employee. The federal, as you see below, that the federal qualitative standard is much more giving, uh, much easier to establish than you would in a state like California that has quantitative. But remember these in your mind. And again, if you want a copy of this, you can email me and I'll send it to them. But if you want to maintain someone's exempt, you've got to be able to meet these standards. Now, just quickly, who's exempt? Executive, for a car wash, we're talking about 99.9% .9 of it would be executive, which is someone who is a, super, a, a supervisor, a general manager. I would be very careful with some assistant manager who is below the general manager because I've seen many claims involving that. Probably the only one we would be dealing with at your normal car wash. All right.
Well, we're switching gears a little bit here, but I want everybody on the phone call to understand that if you are using temporary employees, that the joint employer -er theory, that is car wash A is the employer and XYZ temporary service is the co-employer or vice versa. So you have to, as an employer, know who you're working with. You need to know whether they are, in fact, someone that uh, is properly paying their employees if you're using a temporary employee. And again, if there was a problem with harassment or discrimination or some other discriminate, uh, issues related to you know, retaliation based on uh, protected activity for your filing a workers' comp claim or complaining about something else in the work environment that was protected, you would be a joint employer along with the temporary agency for that employee. California has some very specific rules. If you're in California, hopefully you're aware that under the California Labor Code, you are jointly and severally liable for the payment of wages, failure to have workers' comp, and workplace safety violations after January 1, 2015. So no matter whose employee, it may say that they are on paper, if they weren't paid correctly, or they weren't receiving proper paid sick leave, or whatever the issues are, if the temporary service cannot pay it, then the employer is jointly liable, you, the operator, would be jointly liable, and they could go after you. Same thing for harassment, discrimination claims. You see down at the bottom where it's talking about Title VII, the Fair Employment and Housing Act, State of California, and any other state law, it is virtually unanimous that there is a joint employer relationship between the employer and a temporary service employee. Now, I'm not really going to spend much time on this, but I, I gave you there were DOL, Department of Labor, sorry, standards that were issued on this very joint employment status. And I provided you with a link down there if you want to look at it. Um, but I think if you have the time and you want to look, you will see that it's, it's all encompassing, that, that virtually every relationship where a temporary is sent to an employer and that employer controls their working conditions controls their hours of work, controls when they take breaks, et cetera, is going to be a joint employer with the temporary service. So pretty straightforward. Um, hope that helps. What I'm trying to do is increase your awareness that um, that temporary service is going to be at the same table with you when you're getting sued. And um, you need to be very aware of um, what type of organization you're working with because you could be held responsible for them. Now this is an issue I hear all the time. How many of you have had an employee who got injured at work? I'm going to guess almost everybody. Or how many of you who have had an employee who got injured away from work, a motorcycle accident, or had a a, a non-industrial medical condition, heart attack, stroke, diabetes, epilepsy, whatever it might be. The question is, and I've heard it thousands of times, is when or can I let this employee go? And what I pulled, and, and this was a, a non-California case in the Sixth Circuit, I believe it was in Illinois. Um, but regardless of where it is, it's federal law that applies. And whether you're um, in any of the you know, 48 states or Alaska or Hawaii, the law applies to you, all of us. So in this case, look with me, there was a clerk who worked in a store who had a bad back. Now, you could insert somebody who worked in detail, somebody who worked in a tunnel, somebody who was vacuuming and they were fired, the, this employee was fired because he had a 35 pound lifting restriction. Now in this case, the court held that the employee could pursue his claim under the Americans with Disabilities Act to a trial. And of course, that was not a good decision for the employer. So 
we're going to look at how this employee was protected and what the employer could have done uh, better to make sure that we don't have a problem. We've got four slides on this, so tried to break it down step by step so you, you could look at it. As we've said, you know this, if you haven't had this circumstance, you will, but almost every employee has had somebody with a medical problem who may not, as a result of that, have the ability or limits their ability to do the regular and customer customary essential functions. So I, I want you to remember that term, essential functions, because we're going to be talking about that as we go through this. We're going to talk about what you can do, what the employer did wrong, what do you need to take into account in determining whether the employee can still do the essential functions, and how this should affect the employer's analysis of whether the injured employee can be terminated. Let's go to slide 12. In this case, the court held that it wasn't undisputed that the employee had the ability or couldn't lift 35 or more pounds or that 35 or more pounds was an essential function of the job. And the court looked at as to whether this was an essential function, the court looked at the ADA regulations themselves the employer's judgment as to what was an essential function, which doesn't, that, that's a factor, it's not the sole factor, what it says in a job description, are you required to have a job description? No. Uh, the testimony of the employees, the supervisors, and the co-workers. And basically, I'm going to summarize what the court held. The court held, listen, uh, you let him go because he couldn't do the essential functions, but you haven't proved in uh, any undisputed manner that, the, that this was an essential function uh, of the job. Now, so every employer, everybody on this phone call is covered by the ADA. So if you have an employee, industrial or non-industrial, who has a disability, um, is qualified to do the job or was qualified to do the job and can perform the essential functions of his or her position without accommodation, then that employee is protected. Now, what I want you to focus on is number three. Because if the employee can no longer perform the essential functions of the position with or without an accommodation, because of a permanent and stationary restriction, I'll use that term and talk about it again in a second, then that employee is not protected by the ADA and it wouldn't be a problem to let the employee go. So what do we need to be concerned about when we're thinking about doing that? Let's go to the next slide. How should this affect your analysis of whether an employee can be terminated. Number one, you, me, no one on this phone call, I'm going to assume, is a doctor. So you, in, the, in this case, they did not have a doctor's opinion as to the employee's ability or inability to do the essential function, which in this case was lift 35 or more pounds. Maybe for your position, the essential function is bending, twisting, turning, stooping, working with their arms above shoulder level. It was just the employer's opinion. If you're going to, next bullet point, if you're going to make a decision or take a position regarding an employee's ability to do an essential function, you need to base it on a doctor's opinion. Now, you know, I know, you send your employee to Dr. Feelgood, they're simply going to ask them, can you do the job? The employee says yes, they'll release them without restrictions. So you need to be smarter. You need to ask very specific questions. You need to ask those questions about each job function. I've given them there at the bottom of the page. Can the employee perform these functions, break them out, bending, twisting, turning, stooping, lift 35 pounds, without restrictions. If they say yes, they can do it without restrictions, then they're going to go on to the next next uh, next duty. But if they say no, then can perform with the following restrictions um, slash accommodations, then the doctor, you leave a blank for the doctor to tell us what they are. Third, can no, uh, can no longer perform these essential functions based on his or her permanent medical restrictions. Obviously, if the doctor thinks accommodations are possible, they're going to answer number two. If they go to number, skip to number three, then that means there aren't any accommodations that can be made, and that means 
or in our hypothetical circumstance, the employee can't do that essential function of the job. And remember what we said, if you can't do the essential functions with the job, of the job, with or without an accommodation, you're not protected as a qualified individual with a disability under the ADA. Finally, of the four questions, if the restrictions are temporary in your opinion, how long will they last? So if the doctor says they can't do them now because of a problem, then how long does it last? Is it going to be another week? Is it going to be six months? What's it going to be? Remember, be that specific. Now, a couple questions at the end. Can you require an employee to be able to do the essential functions of their job with or without accommodations? Yes, that means you do not have to provide light duty work. Is providing light duty work sometimes a good idea? Yes, it is, because otherwise the employee stays home, gets two-thirds of their pay tax-free, and watches those how to sue your employer commercials on TV every day. Now, can you potentially, next question, require an employee to undergo a medical exam to determine if he slash she can do the essential functions of the job? Answer, yes. Are there potential issues with this? Yes. You could have dueling doctor problems. You could have one doctor, Dr. Feelgood, saying one thing, another doctor, Dr. Strongarm, saying another. Now, there are ADA, Americans with Disability Act compliance issues for medical exams, but you can require a medical exam when you're concerned about the employee's ability to do the essential functions of the job, so that shouldn't be an issue. Now, this next point, and this makes sense hopefully to everybody, are there other options? Listen, you can request a medical opinion on the ability to do the essential function from the employee's own treating doctor. Now, if his own treating doctor says he can no longer do essential function or essential functions of his job and it's a permanent restriction, we are in great shape. Hopefully that makes sense and we will terminate them based on what? based on the doctor's opinion and based on the fact we can't accommodate those restrictions and we don't have any other work that would fit that they could do that they're qualified to do. Finally, do I have to provide light duty if an employee can't not do the essential functions of the job? Answer is no, but I commented on that earlier, right? Um, you're worried about your workers' compensation insurance mod. You want to may want to bring them back and have them do something instead of sitting home and getting money or doing nothing. Okay, now I'm going to go a little faster on these, um, but again, no matter what state you are in, you should have an arbitration agreement in place. That arbitration agreement should limit class or collective actions. Um, those class or collective action language would have to specifically be set forth in the arbitration agreement, um, and that would mean that employees, if they have a problem, would have to bring it to you individually, couldn't join in this group, and basically sit back and do nothing. They would have to pursue it. You know the people that work for you. I know the people that work for you. Most of them would never pick up the ball and run with it, but if somebody picks it up and runs with it for them, they will. Now, there is currently a controversy as to whether these class or collective action waivers are enforceable, and the next slide is going to show that there were three cases. I'm going to jump there and come back, I promise. There are these three cases have been granted review by the U.S. Supreme Court. Two of them said that a class and collective action waiver um, is void because it violates the protected activity variety protections from the National Labor Relations Act. I, I know that's a lot of legalese, but, but bear with me. W one of the cases has said, listen, this protective action, uh, protected concerted action protection of the National Labor Relations Act is preempted by, and I'm going to go back, uh, sorry for going back to slide, but see where it says FAA, Federal Arbitration Act. So when will we get a decision from the U.S. Supreme Court? Probably a year. What should you do in the meantime? Make sure you continue to keep the class or collective action waivers in your document. Um, again, worst case, they say it's unenforceable. 
best case, it stops you be, from being sued on a class action claim for overtime, meal periods, rest periods, off the clock work, whatever it might be. Next issue, can you enforce your staffing agency's arbitration agreement? Now, listen, if you're using a temporary agency, I'm going to keep this short because I don't know how many of you are, but if you're using a temporary service agency and somebody sues you for harassment because your supervisor was harassing a temporary employee or there's a class action claim um, and a lot of the employees working for you are from a staffing agency, um, if they work for XYZ staffing agency and your operator A, XYZ staffing agency, unless it specifically references operator A as a third party beneficiary to this agreement, um, the, a court in California has said, listen, that agreement only protects the staffing agency. There's a couple slides on that that we'll see here in a minute. And, and again, I won't go into them in great depth, um, but if you, you want to get copies, as I've said before, you can email me. So remember, if you're using a staffing agency you, and, you want to get the, and you want to get the benefit of an arbitration agreement, you need to first of all see if your staffing agency even has one. Number two, if they have one, is it something that's legally enforceable and will protect you? Three, does it cover class and collective action claims? Okay. Um, if you have an arbitration agreement, I would tell you there are cases that have talked about how language in the handbook makes an arbitration agreement unenforceable. Um, so again, I would tell you best practice um, is that you have it separate because you know and I know no employees read the handbook, right? And you know and I know they don't read the arbitration language. They wouldn't read it if it was in the handbook or it was a separate document you gave to them at the same time. So why not make it a separate document and not worry about language in the handbook? What am I talking about language in the handbook? If your handbook says, for example, uh, this is for your information only, or this is not a contract, and then you go into court and try and enforce it, the court's going to say, uh, why should I enforce it when you yourself said it wasn't enforceable and it was for information only? So let's go to the next slide. There is the language that we skipped to earlier about the class or collective action wing, uh, waivers uh, and the FAA is versus the NLRA. What's your takeaway from this? If you have class or collective action waivers in your arbitration agreement, leave it there. Let's see what the federal uh, U.S. Supreme Court says. Um, here's the case. I, I won't, again, go through it line by line, but where a citrus packing company tried to enforce an arbitration agreement that was included in the staffing agency's agreement, and the court said no. And again, what do we learn from that? You need to work with the staffing agency to make sure it covers you, make sure they have an agreement, make sure it covers class and collective actions. There were two slides on that, 17 and 18. And again, if you need those. Finally, um, here are some areas, and again, uh, 200 plus car washes that I work with, these are all issues that I see on a very regular basis on wage and hour problems associated with uh, uh, operators and their car washes. So I'm going to go through each one of these in the next couple of slides, and we're going to talk about what you can do and what the issues are. So let's go to the next slide. Engage to wait off the clock time, not on time clock. So that means you have people reporting to the car wash, waiting to see if they're going to go to work. And if you don't have a schedule where you can show that Johnny or Susie was scheduled or wasn't scheduled to work, then what happens is state, federal agencies, the Department of Labor, uh, whatever your local, if you have one, wage and hour uh, enforcement agencies at the state level, can actually uh, have undercover folks that set across the street uh, that uh, do um, you know, secretive interviews of your employees. And if the employees say that they came there and stood around for an hour and uh, before they were put on the clock and sometimes they punched out and kept working, they're going to file an off-the-clock claim against you. What I would encourage you to do and at the risk of stating the obvious is having an off-the-clock work policy as a part of the employee handbook. It basically says 
You're not going to work before you punch in. You're not going to work after you punch out. If anybody asks you to do that, you need to immediately report it to the owner, right? Somebody above the general manager um, where they can um, get some relief if that's being asked of them to do. Now, this minimum wage, overtime, meal and rest periods. Um, take a look to the right. Be sure that employees record their own time worked. Don't have the manager do it. Have the employees enter their time. Are you required to have them do that? No, but it is much more credible when we're being sued and they are no longer your friends and they're saying that they worked off the clock and therefore didn't weren't paid enough to even cover the minimum wage. Uh, certainly didn't get overtime, and if you're um, anywhere, state or fed, and you can't show that the employer was receiving meal and rest periods, you could be subject to a meal and rest period claim. If you're not sure what the laws are in that area, you need to check with your counsel, make sure that you know the rules, and comply. To the left again, inaccurate or altered time cards or time records. Listen, I, I, I know it's a pain in the butt, but I'm telling you the best thing to do would be to have the employees to certify um, slash verify the correctness of their time cards or records for each pay period as a part of submitting them as a further meeting our burden of proof that's showing that the employee accurately recorded their time. Now, next on the right column, have a clear policy regarding editing or changing of time work to entries and watch for rounding policy violations. Let me start with this. No one should be changing an employee's time on a time card without the employee being aware of it and initialing off on it. Because when you get sued, if your supervisor is making unilateral edits to time cards, there you then your time cards are going to be argued to not be accurate in any way because of what happened. Um, finally, on this slide, know the pay stub requirements for each state you operate in. In California, for example, there's a labor code section 226A that lists everything that's supposed to be on a pay stub. It doesn't specifically refer to paid sick leave. That also has to be on a pay stub. And uh, God forbid if you use piece rate in any way, then that would have to be added to uh, the pay stub as well under Labor Code Section 226.2. So know the states that you're in and make sure your pay stub information is accurate. Listen, if you're doing it wrong, then there isn't going to be a question about liability. It's just going to be how much do you have to pay. Okay, um, improper deductions. Remember, um, as a general rule, you can't pass on a risk of doing business to an employee. General rule. I mean, it varies state by state. Employee breaks a piece of equipment, employee loses a piece of equipment, employee backs a car into a wall or a pole or into another car. You know, generally speaking, and I'm saying this generally, California for sure, you cannot pass that cost on to the employee. If you, the vacation of termination depends on state law. Um, some states you have to pay for what they've earned but not use. Other states, um, it can be forfeited if they haven't used it. You need to know state by state which one you're in. Uh, FLSA, Fair Labor Standards Act, payment of liquidated damages, state penalties, you need to know that they vary greatly from state to state. They can be very, very ominous and burdensome for employers who don't know the rules and get whacked. Um, retaliation claims, have an anti-retaliation policy in place, train your supervisors to what to do. Use of arbitration agreements, we've talked about those. Um, they're important. Everyone should have them. Um, I would strongly suggest if you don't have one that you check with counsel and consider putting them in place. Let me take a look um, at questions that we have. Um, let me see if I can't make this any bigger, but I'm going to try and read through it real quick. Um, there was a question, in the event of inclement weather, rain, etc., cetera, um, that we've seen le lately, can you explain the labor code on sending employees home and if they have to pay them two hours if they show up? That is referred to as reporting time pay. 
Um, this question is referencing a California law. California law, if it is an act of God, which rain would fall into that category, the Labor Commissioner's own operations and procedures manual um, says that rain, when it rains, that is an act of God and you do not have to pay reporting time pay. I would tell you this though, reporting time pay, if you are closing the car wash completely, then, um, I and it's because it's raining, I would not worry about reporting time pay. If you're sending three, four, five people home, but you still have five, six, seven, three, four people working, probably not your traditional waiting time pay issue or circumstance, and in that circumstance, you may be better off to pay the reporting time pay. Um, that is all the questions that we have. We are at uh, 1243. I appreciate all of your attention. Again, if any one of you would like a copy of the um, PowerPoint, if that would assist you in any way, please email me at Gary, I'm sorry, at G Bethel, B E T H E L, at littler.com. Will, done for the day. Thank you, Gary. Thank you, everyone, for attending today. Uh, if you have any questions, feel free to reach out to me at will at wcwa.org. Otherwise, have a great day.